Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We are live on the second day of the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. Remember, we are streaming on YouTube Live too. Well, we have the honor today of having Dr. Jeffrey Wisoff. Dr. Jesse, jo Jeffrey Wisoff is a well-known pediatric neurosurgeon at Hasenfeld Children's Hospital, New York School of Medicine. He is the director of the Division of Pediatric Neurosurgery and associate professor of neurosurgery and pediatrics at the New York University Langone Medical Center. Today at the IWBNC, Dr. Wisoff is going to share his lecture, Surgical Treatment of Pediatric Craniopharyngioma. Please type your questions in the Q&A section. We will read them after the end of Dr. Wisoff's interventions. Welcome, Dr. Wisoff, and thank you. It's all yours. Thank you so much. It is really a pleasure to be here today and to participate in this international web-based Congress. Uh, I'd like to share you some thoughts, philosophies, um, and lessons I've learned over the 30 years that I've been practicing and caring for children with craniopharyngioma. And all we need to do now is get this thing to advance. Ah, okay. So I'm fortunate that my father was a neurosurgeon and there were lessons I learned from him that have been inspiring to me throughout my career. The first is that a neurosurgeon must be an optimist and that comes to the philosophy we'll talk about today. The second, he said, having grown up in the 50s, 60s and 70s, is an experienced neurosurgeon as one who has seen his cured meningiomas recur. And I would say that an experienced neurosurgeon in our field is one who has seen his cured craniopharyngiomas recur and this comes to talking about overall and disease-free survival. An experienced neurosurgeon is one who has seen enough complications that he or she has a vague idea how to avoid them. And again, that's gonna talk about technique and experience. Harvey Cushing was the first one who really described the complete panoply of complications that occur with craniopharyngioma, describing them as kaleidoscopic tumors whose management in 1927, and again, nearly a century later, is one of the most baffling problems to the pediatric and adult neurosurgeon. For over 50 years, the optimal treatment has been controversial. What we have to accept is with 50 years of experience, there's similarity in progression-free and overall survival at 10 years between those advocating total resection, as Bill Sweet from Harvard advocated, as well as those who advocate partial resection and radiation, such as John Shillito from Boston Children's Hospital, two giants from the 60s and 70s. The other thing is that even after 50 years, we have limited information on what is the quality of life in our adult survivors of childhood craniopharyngioma. And at the end of the day, it may be quality of life that is our most important uh, indicator. So what are the assumptions that I believe we should have when dealing with children with craniopharyngioma? We want to treat with curative intent. Unlike an adult where palliation for three, four, five years is useful, in a child, a family is looking at the next 70 years of life. So your best chance of cure is going to be at the time of first treatment. And all children need to have multimodality consultations, including at a minimum, neurosurgery and radiation oncology. If the surgeon or the family choose to undergo the path of radical surgery, you must be certain that there's the socioeconomic support for the post-operative management of endocrine and hypothalamic problems. I do believe that radical resection can provide good quality of life and that will be hopefully demonstrated as we go. And I think experience matters and I hope I can demonstrate that as well. If we look at what our measures of outcome are. Before 1970, we really were talking about mortality and morbidity. As the 80s came around, we started looking at gross scales of outcomes, such as the Glasgow Outcome Scale. And into the 90s, we started to look at some performance measures, such as Konofsky and Lansky. For the last 20 years, it's really been quality of life measures that have been the ultimate goal of any treatment we have in neurosurgery, and particularly in pediatric neurosurgery. These include detailed neurocognitive measures, neuroendocrine evaluation, formal ophthalmologic examination, and ultimately the impact of hypothalamic injury. 
The problem we have with quality of life measures is there is no gold standard. There are too many competing scales. So it's sometimes hard to compare one evaluation to another, but nonetheless, it's quality of life that ultimately will be the judge of whether or not we have done well by our patients. We've suggested a uh, craniofringioma clinical status score that we published about a decade ago, looking at what we believe are the five domains, neurologic deficits, visual deficits, pituitary dysfunction, hypothalamic dysfunction, and educational status. And we've uh, been using this for a little over a decade, and we now have seen some other publications that have taken up this type of status score, which gives us a broad view of quality of life. So let's start by saying, is there a gold standard for treatment of craniopharyngiomas? And I think there is a gold standard, and to that we're indebted to Herman Mueller and the craniopharyngioma uh, study that he's conducted in Germany for now nearly three decades. They now have close to um, 500 patients they are following. Um, this is some of the data that came out in 2000 and 2007. And they've been able to collect about 85 to 90% of all the pediatric craniopharyngiomas that occur in Germany each year and follow them longitudinally. Now there are some problems with the data. In particular, if you look, the vast majority of centers are seeing less than five patients in a six year period, or basically less than one patient per year. So the advantage is we do have prospective multi-institutional data, but the vast majority of patients are being treated at low volume centers. And there is no uniform treatment strategy. Furthermore, it turns out the low volume centers are more likely to perform total resection than high volume centers, which speaks to a question of experience and judgment. So what I think that this group has shown is what one can consider a community standard or benchmark against which one has to examine one's own results, whether you pursue a course of radical resection, partial resection and irradiation, or intracystic therapies. And in this, if you will, community standard, not a center of excellence standard, but a community standard, we see that as one looks at 20 and 30 years, there are similar overall survival and progression-free survival, regardless of treatment, which again speaks to both the question of quality of life, since survival will be similar, and also whether or not centers of excellence, high volume centers can alter this sort of experience. So here's our community standard, and this is what we have to compare ourselves with constantly. The other question that has come up and has been a major um, area of research concern over the last decade and a half is can we identify patients who are high risk for adverse effects from their treatment. And to this, I think we're very much indebted, particularly to the group at Necker and Fontmalade in Paris, Stephanie Puget and Christian St. Rose, who compared their large series of patients and have identified patients that have a higher risk of hypothalamic injury. And they've looked and they've looked at pre and post-operative imaging and given them a grade of zero to two zero being a small prechiasmatic intracellular tumor, one being a tumor that involves or displaces the floor of the third ventricle, and two, a tumor that's heavily invading the hypothalamus. And then you see the corresponding postoperative results where basically you have no hypothalamus left, you have a defect in the floor of the third, and here the floor of the third remains intact. And they, after looking at this, sort of established a concept of hypothalamic sparing surgery to decrease the risk of severe hypothalamic complications, particularly obesity, which appears to significantly impact our long-term quality of life. Talking about with those who are grade zero, basically having complete resection, grade one, either complete or incomplete, and those with grade two, significant hypothalamic damage 
purposefully leaving tumor behind. With those sorts of philosophies, they have gone from having a significant risk of um, hypothalamic dysfunction from 54% down to 28% with this hypothalamic sparing surgery. As we go through this talk and we look at our own experience over the past three decades, remember this number of 28% with hypothalamic sparing surgery. So what are the treatments that are available for these group of patients? Again, I believe that the treatment should have potential for cure. And in that, we're looking at radical surgery, irradiation alone, irradiation with resection or cyst aspiration, and various intracystic therapies. Partial resection alone and cyst aspiration alone will never be curative. And I think with rare exception, should not be considered. We have at our institution, in my experience over the last three decades, tried to establish a strategy for total resection of primary tumors. If a primary tumor was totally resected at first recurrence, we would attempt surgery again. If we were able to get a gross total resection with the first recurrence, we'd observe. If it was a partial resection, those children would go to radiation. And if you had a second recurrence, you'd go to radiation as well. Now this obviously is a pediatric philosophy and it doesn't apply for everyone. This is an 80 year old woman who we cared for who obviously would not be a great candidate for total resection who had an endoscopic fenestration and aspiration, did well for two years, tumor recurred, re-aspirated and did well again. Again, avoiding the radiation damage that one would see in an elderly individual and doing a palliative procedure that is very worthwhile at the end of life. A more extreme example is a 90-year-old independent woman who had rapid cognitive decline and multi-system organ failure and has this lesion, but is really symptomatic from her hydrocephalus. And with a simple shunt, this woman remained independent for another three years. So not everyone gets treated the same way. And particularly as one ages, the philosophy and the options change. But for today, we're gonna to think more in the pediatric realm. So when looking at primary craniopharyngioma in children, there is conventional wisdom. One, that younger children will do worse. Giant tumors will do worse. Any residual calcification increases the risk of recurrence and requires irradiation. And post-operative hypothalamic dysfunction obesity is inevitable and leads to poor quality of life. I hope to say that these conventional wisdoms are not true. So questions I'd like to answer for you today is what is the likelihood of cure? What is the impact of these factors of age, size, calcification, the acute and late morbidity and mortality, quality of life after radical resection, and who should treat craniopharyngioma does experience matter can we do better than the community standard established by Hermann Mueller and the German group? I'm limiting my patients to those who have had at least five years of follow-up. So we're gonna talk about a 30 year experience from 1985 to 2015, where we did 172 operations in 146 patients. And roughly 120 of these were pediatric patients with an average follow-up now of in excess of 16 years. Patients' average age was about eight years for the primary tumors and 12 years for the recurrent tumors, showing that those tumors who do recur will generally recur within the first four or five years after whatever treatment they receive. The majority of pediatric tumors tend to be larger, unlike adult tumors, um, with at least 15% of them being in the giant range. Hydrocephalus is seen in about a third of the tumors, which again reflects the larger size and the often retrochiasmatic location of these tumors. Uh, in our group, the tumors were sort of evenly distributed between those that were pre and post um, with about 10% of them being those that would be totally amenable to trans transnasal endoscopic resection in virtually anybody's hands.
In this series, and again, because it extended over 30 years, we used an extended terrional approach in over 95% of the surgeries. And we had eight stage surgeries, both primary and recurrent tumors that were both via craniotomy and via transnasal approach. Additionally, an eight transnasal resections were done for recurrent lesions. When I think about the surgical technique for radical resection of craniotomy, I think there are five aspects that one has to consider in advance. Fixation, positioning, incision, the actual craniotomy, and how one does the dissection intradurally. For, for fixation, I happen to like the Sagita head holder. It gives you multiple um, rotational degrees of freedom and you can actually use rigid fixation down to less than two years of age. And it allows us to get almost 60 degrees range of uh, uh, visualization. For positioning, I always think about rotate, flex, and extend. As you wanna rotate the head about 60 degrees away from you, you wanna flex the head forward and you want to extend at the neck. And this will bring you basically in a subfrontal approach, whether you go through a traditional subfrontal or through a lateral extended terrional approach. The traditional incision has been a linear incision just behind the hairline. I think our plastic surgery colleagues have taught us that this incision tends not to be the greatest cosmetically. And I like to use the so-called stealth or zigzag incision and bring it all the way to the opposite mid pupillary line and this tends to give us a much better cosmetic effect. You no longer get that parting of the hair that tends to occur with the linear incision and it heals quite nicely. And in kids, because the muscle is not terribly thick, we can reflect the muscle with the scalp. We don't have to do a separate uh, muscle dissection, which also tends to preserve the vascular supply and Innervation of the muscle, we get less temporal wasting by preserving the muscle this way. We always want to dissect the periorbita. And then our craniotomy is really going to be an extended orbitofrontozygomatic approach. We need to get distal to the frontozygomatic suture. So our key landmarks are the root of the zygoma, the frontozygomatic suture, the supraorbital rim, and the keyhole. And I usually like to do two burr holes, one in the lower temporal region, one in the keyhole. And then we do our cuts sequentially going along the posterior, uh, medial, anteriorly, coming across the uh, root of the zygoma, and then coming across the roof of the orbit with, uh, I like to use osteotomes, so we can remove the entire uh, bony construct as a single piece, which again, when replacing it, makes for a nice cosmetic result. Microsurgical dissection to some degree depends upon whether it's anterior or posterior, pre or retrochiasmatic. You always want to do a wide sylvian fissure dissection. You always identify the vascular anatomy in the sylvian fissure. Remember your vascular anatomy whenever you work in the supracellular cistern is your constant. If you can identify distal and work your way proximal from the middle cerebral to the bifurcation to the internal carotid, you will always know where you're located. You always know that your vascular anatomy will identify the location of your visual apparatus, which will always be medial to the carotid, the bifurcation, and the anterior cerebral. And then we try to do as much arachnoid dissection around the tumor before we decompress it. Quite often, the wall of the cystic components are very thin, almost diaphanous, and if one prematurely deflates the cyst, one will lose the arachnoidal dissection planes and inevitably leave pieces of capsule behind. And then internal tumor decompression and then tumor resection with removal of the capsule. I'm going to try to show you, hopefully time permits, two surgical cases. Um, this is a 12 year old woman, that we, 12 year old girl who we cared for about uh, 13 years ago. She had a typical pre three centimeter tumor. It's one that could be approached definitely from a transnasal approach, 
although she had a relatively small sinus and relatively small nasal passages, we elected to go transcranial and did obtain a total resection. So here we are looking at the um, optic nerve coming in. Here we have the uh, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, optic nerve. And here we are starting our arachnoidal dissection, looking across, seeing the opposite optic nerve. We want to do lots of arachnoidal dissection. We always want to take care not to overstretch. Looking lateral to the right optic nerve, separating tumor from the carotid. And I like to work around the lateral margin of the tumor and under the optic nerve as much as possible, gradually getting around the back end of the tumor until I can see the membrane of Lilliquist. It is extremely rare for the membrane of Lilliquist to be violated with a primary tumor. And as one gets around and sees the intact membrane of Lilliquist posteriorly, it gives you a tremendous degree of satisfaction and safety. Here we are looking around the back of the tumor and placing a cotinoid around the back of the tumor over Lilliquist, knowing that our posterior perforators are clean. Working across to the outside of the tumor under the left optic nerve, remembering as we're working at an angle, we will see the opposite carotid underneath the nerve. Now we'll decompress the cyst having worked around as many arachnoidal planes as possible. And as the cyst comes down, it gives us more room, typical crankcase or motor oil fluid. Here we are continuing to work around the plane, gradual pressure, and it's always gentle traction on the tumor and trying to dissect the arachnoid and the normal tissue away. We don't want to just be pulling on the tumor. We always want to be cognizant of where the perforators are. Here we are now opening the tumor. We'll further decompress the tumor, give us more room having worked our arachnoidal planes. And you can see now you can get an excellent view over the top of the tumor, separate completely from the uh, chiasm. And in the distance, we can see part of the uh, pituitary stalk which eventually merges with the tumor. And since we're going for a total resection, we've elected to divide the pituitary stalk as low as possible. If I am going for a total resection, I want to identify pituitary stalk early and divide the stalk as distal to the hypothalamus as possible. That avoids traction on the hypothalamus. Now working in the cell itself, you want to separate the tumor from the dura of the cella. If the tumor appears to involve the dura of the cella, you can go between the layers of the cella. Both pledgets of surgical gauze and flow seal work very nicely. We're taking care of the venous bleeding that inevitably occurs as one gets into parts of the uh, sinus working in the cella. And ultimately we can get around the entire tumor. As we get around the entire tumor, we wanna make sure we're not leaving anything in the blind spot anteriorly. So we use angled mirrors and a 30 and 45 degree endoscope to look under the uh, planum sphenoidale and tuberculum cellae to make sure that all the tumor anteriorly. And here's our final view. Another boy with a similar picture, grade one, this was an eight month old boy with an acute loss of vision, similar vision, uh, similar picture at surgery, total resection, 12 years postoperatively. He's now in his thirties. Uh, he is apparently an avid video gamer. And to this day, this young man makes his living doing video gaming, which his parents blame on his surgery. In contrast to these grade one tumors, I think the grade two tumor, the grade, I'm sorry, the grade zero tumors now growing to the grade one tumors are a bit more difficult. I think this illustrates why you always wanna have both an MRI and CT scan on these patients, give better identification of the anatomy. 
because calcification will always be far better defined by the grade two tumor, I'm sorry, by the CT scan. And again, similar picture and similar total resection. This girl is also 25 years out and has five children of her own. Uh, she did require some uh, hormonal assistance for her pregnancies, but they were otherwise uneventful. This is the tumor that becomes the biggest question, can or should these be operated on uh, for radical resection? Are these the ones we should do partial resections? This is a three-year-old uh, physician's child with a five centimeter retrochiasmatic grade two tumor. Uh, we'll play a little bit of this video. Sorry, went a little too far. Let's see if we can go backwards. And for the sake of time, I will uh, speed this up at some point. As I said, we do always start with a wide sylvian fissure dissection. I also find this allows us to get our inherent tremor under control, which most of us will have at one point or another. And as one dissects, one gets the distal branches of the middle cerebral, follows them to the main middle cerebral trunk, and then ultimately to the carotid bifurcation, the carotid. Here we can see um, carotid artery and the right nerve working lateral. We're going to identify the posterior cerebral, the anterior communicator, identify the perforating branches, and again, working in arachnoidal planes, separating out all the perforating vessels. And we work in the carotid bifurcation. Any avenue you can where there's an arachnoidal plane, you can work to gradually separate tumors and preserve perforating vessels, which is the key to all the surgery. As I mentioned, we want to get around the back of the tumor. You can start to see part of the uh, posterior cerebral artery coming off the basilar in the distance where the dissector is working. And you can see how the membrane of the liliquist remains intact. And we can see perforators going into the brainstem distally. Here we are working anteriorly as we've been working in all these arachnoidal planes and draining CSF, chias are plastered against the tuberculum initially does fall backwards and get more and more room. But eventually you're going to have to work through the lamina terminals for these retrochiasmatic grade two tumors. You wanna to try to always stay in the midline. And one of the tricks is you will see a vessel coming right up the middle of the chiasm, which guides you to the midline. We want to internally decompress the calcific component while trying to preserve capsule. Again, constantly going back and forth. Here we are again, sectioning the pituitary stalk as distal as we can. In this case, just above the diaphragma. We can see the basilar. We can see third nerve between uh, the well, we did see third nerve a moment ago between the superior cerebellar and the posterior cerebral. And again, as we work the planes, as we gradually decompress, the tumor continues to deliver itself. The entire thing becomes more and more relaxed. And eventually we will deliver tumor both through lamina terminalis, as well as in the optico-carotid optico triangle. slow, steady pressure, and gradually pushing normal tissue away, trying to preserve that gliotic plane between hypothalamus and tumor. And I'm going to just cut towards the end so that at the end, one wants to see this sort of picture identifying carotid, anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, posterior communicator, anterior communicator, all the perforators, right, left optic, chiasm, right track, left track, and lamina terminalis. Recurrent craniofringiomas in and of themselves are an incredibly difficult problem. Um, we've had experience now with over 40 recurrent craniofringiomas. About one third have been the patients of, of my own. This is a child who I'd call a secondary tumor. That's the one who had a gross total resection up front. Uh, a giant tumor, looked good immediately after surgery. Uh, six months later, had a small lesion that grew over the next six months. We approached this through a trans 
colossal approach, resected it, and this child remains disease-free 20 years later and works as a professional model. This is a child who I think had the worst combination of treatments. That is, it's a girl who had progressive visual loss and underwent multiple cyst aspirations without any intrathecal therapy. And with each time as the cyst collapsed, there would be a transient improvement in vision, but the collapsed cyst would create greater and greater solid calcific tumor to the point where she was virtually blind. And at surgery, you can see that the optic tract and optic nerve are almost translucent. And although we were able to resect the tumor and get total resection, she remains blind, although disease-free 20 years later. Here's a child who had been treated at another institution with two attempts at resection, experienced a stroke after the second attempt, had radiation therapy and recurred. And this child was approached through a staged uh, approach where we went first transcranial from below and then transcranial through a transcolosal approach and obtained a curative resection having failed to previous partial and radiation. And then this is a child who's had multiple, multiple procedures and basically has an ossified mass at the skull base and she ultimately died from her tumor. So what is the outcome? So what is the likelihood of surgical cure? In our hands, it, with a primary uh, cure, we can, with a primary patient, we can achieve uh, total resection and curative treatment in approximately 85% of patients with the first therapy. On the other hand, those children who present after having failed primary therapy have about a 60% chance of being retrieved with a radical resection. Durable disease control can be established in about 95% of patients who present with primary tumors using this philosophy of a radical primary surgery, an attempt at second surgery for the first recurrence, and then radiation therapy if there's a second recurrence. And overall, we've had greater than 95% primary control. We also have to be a little circumspect in deciding what is a recurrent tumor. These are all children who had tumor that involved the cell tersica, who developed small cystic lesions several years later. And in two of these cases, the lesions, I'm sorry. In two of these cases, the lesions spontaneously regressed and the other, the lesion got larger. This one was resected and noted to be a recurrent tumor, whereas the others we believe are most likely um, just arachnoid. On the other hand, this is a child who developed a small recurrence, was scheduled for a follow-up study, did not get the follow-up study, but was started on growth hormone and had a rapid recurrence. So one needs to manage these small cystic lesions with diligent, frequent follow-up before deciding whether or not additional adjuvant therapy is necessary. Impact of age, tumor size, and calcifications. We saw absolutely no difference in progression-free survival, whether you were younger or older than six years of age. And in fact, the, uh, those who were uh, younger did just as well. Giant tumors did just as well as smaller tumors for progression-free survival unless it was a recurrent giant tumor. And this again speaks to the idea of trying to give your best treatment up front. Or smaller tumor, with the giant tumors actually having a slightly better overall survival for primary tumors. Calcification alone did not make a difference either. So we do not radiate for calcification alone. Morbidity and mortality in the acute and late stage. Our overall survival for virgin tumors has been 93% going out to 20 years, but those that have recurred at 20 years have about a 70% overall survival, which is similar to that 
which we saw with the German group. We had two perioperative mortalities among our primary tumors, a 15-year-old who had vasospasm on postoperative day two, following the resection of a two centimeter pre tumor, and a seven-year-old with dysautonomia who had malignant hypertension from dysautonomia. The late mortalities tended to be related quite often to endocrine or hypothalamic dysfunction. We have uniformly used postoperative nimodipine in all of our patients since 1991 and have not experienced significant uh, stroke since that time. Recurrent tumors had a much higher case mortality. The operative mortality was similar, about 2% and primarily vascular, but the late mortality was from stroke, intraoperative bleeding, endocrine dysfunction, and two children developed radiation-induced glioblastomas. This was one girl, an Israeli girl, who had this tumor. We obtained what we thought was a gross total resection, but we did see uh, calcifications on the post-op imaging. We radiated her, and eight years later, she developed a glioblastoma. In retrospect, that was a mistake. This was early in our experience, and those calcifications alone we should have simply observed. This is a 16-year-old, three surgeries and radiation by the age of four at another institution. Came to us at 16 with this recurrent, multiply recurrent, multiply operated tumor. We we're able to obtain a what we thought was a total resection, but notice these flare changes in the brain stem. Six months after this resection, she developed this hemorrhagic tumor, which turned out to be a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, nonetheless from her previous radiation, she succumbed shortly afterwards. Looking at multivariate analysis, the things that were important were subtotal resection up front and size of tumor when it came to overall and progression-free survival. Looking at our outcome, the neurologic scores actually turned out to be very similar with very few children having new permephysites. Hypothalamic dysfunction, we saw a number of our patients had hypothalamic dysfunction at baseline. And overall, severe hypothalamic dysfunction was only seen in about 6%, but about 15% of patients had new and significant dysfunction. Looking at severe obesity, we had about 16% who had morbidly obese with a BMI of greater than uh, 35, or looking at another way, two standard deviations above, three standard deviations above. There was a trend for recurrent tumors doing worse, but overall, our morbid obesity without a hypothalamic sparing philosophy was similar to what Necker and font Malat demonstrated. And in fact, younger children had less morbid obesity. Unfortunately, those children who presented with recurrent tumors had a very high incidence of hypothalamic dysfunction. And I think we have become more conservative with hypothalamic dissection in the recurrent tumors whenever possible. What is the quality of life? Looking at education, Overall, the vast, vast majority of children, 85% remain the same or have improved. About 15% needed some educational support, but only 8% had significant educational disability or were not at grade level. There did not appear to be a significant statistical difference, although there's a trend that IQ did a little bit worse with larger tumors Retrochized MAC tumors seemed to do a little bit worse, but again, this was a trend, not significant. And hydrocephalus did not seem significant. Looking at one of these quality of life measures, we have seen that those who are at risk, when you look at these Likert scales, basically above 60 and below 40 are patients who have difficulties. The vast majority are within the normal range or slightly at risk.
significant risk has been unlikely or unusual in these behavioral checklists. Although there is a trend for school and total um, psychological dysfunction, particularly in retrochiasmatic tumors. There was no significant change in behavior by whether or not the tumors were recurrent, which was something we did not expect before we looked at this data. Recurrent tumors do tend to have more of a sense of physical disability, but not as much uh, psychosocial disability. They tend to be right in the normal range along with their primary patient. When we looked at patients who were more than two decades after gross total resection and now adults, we wanted to know what was their quality of life? What was their sexual functioning? We saw that almost all the patients had completed at least high school level. Two thirds were employed, although one third remained at a student level. And interestingly, in spite of visual deficits, three quarters of them had driver's licenses. We did see that these patients tended to be more likely to be single and more likely to be living still with their families, regardless of whether or not they were uh, employed and whether or not they were otherwise independent. Looking at the SF36, which is a pretty good broad view of um, psychosocial and quality of life functioning, we could not identify any difference between our patients and age match controls, either for physical or what would be considered mental or cognitive status. Similarly, when we looked at the BMI and compared it to those in the United States, and mind you, we do have an epidemic of obesity in the United States, there was no significant difference in the class three BMI, that is the morbidly obese between the average adult in the United States and our craniopharyngioma patients, although there's no question that more of our patients were overweight, that is BMIs between 25 and 30, or were somewhat obese BMIs between 30 and 35, they were about 25% more likely to have more weight than their counterparts. But again, morbidly obese was not significantly different. When one looks at the change in BMI, there was a trend over time, which again is what we see in the normal population as well. And we did see no significant difference when one looks purely at location. But again, going back to the mean BMI versus the Puget scale, that definitely was significant. So again, as we think retrospectively on this experience, BMI, hypothalamic morbidity is definitely more likely to occur with the tumors involving the hypothalamus. Interestingly, at least in this US population, BMI did not have an impact on the SF36, so we could not correlate BMI and quality of life. Similarly, we saw no difference in sexual function, either their ability to enjoy sex, ability to become sexually aroused, or degree of sexual interest between this population and their age match controls. Finally, who should treat craniopharyngioma? Does experience matter? When we look at um, our quality of life score, what we see is that there were significant changes in long-term quality of life, and they all tended to reflect those who had more morbidity preoperatively and we also found changes based upon surgical experience. That is, when we look at each quintile, that is each five-year uh, experience, we see that there was an improvement in outcome in neurologic function over time, in hypothalamic dysfunction in each five-year epoch, and in the educational outcomes with no real difference in visual outcome, pituitary outcome, um, or the WEN classification, another quality of life measurement. 
And this sort of makes sense. That is with experience and with learning how to manipulate tissue, we're doing better in preserving and preventing stroke than perhaps nimotapine has played a role in that. We've done better with being gentle with the hypothalamus. And we've done better by improving hypothalamic outcomes and improving educational outcomes. Visual outcomes are primarily the effect of the tumor before surgery and pituitary dysfunction is a universal with these patients. So what am I gonna say in conclusion? One can consider that over 90% of primary craniopharyngiomas can be cured with radical surgery and a good quality of life. This is not for everyone. It is not for every surgeon, it is not for every patient, it's not for every country. There has to be a social safety net for long-term hormonal replacement and hypothalamic management. There has to be the ability for patients, families, and society to help control the obesity. Overall disease control can be obtained in 95% of patients with primary surgery, secondary surgery, and tertiary radiation. Mortality should be less than 2% and has been in our last 20 years, with a case mortality under 5%. The future is definitely better identification of children at risk for hypothalamic injury. The Puget scale is good, but it still remains a blunt instrument. We need to figure out which are the 20 to 40% of patients who should not have radical resection with grade two tumors versus the 60 to 80% of patients who can safely be resected. And eventually there will be medical treatments for obesity. We still need better 10 and 20 year survival and quality of life comparisons, and we need to eventually get to the molecular targets for adjuvant or even neoadjuvant drug therapy. We're seeing this in the adult papillary craniopharyngiomas. Our WINT-driven pediatric adenomatous tumors have not yet reached that standard. So I want to thank you for your attention. I can answer some questions. Thank you very much for, for such a wonderful lecture, Dr. Wieshoff. I'm sure all the audience has learned from your robust experience. Right now, as you said, we have some few questions from the public that I'm going to read to you. So, first question. Do you have data regarding the growth of rock heart calcified postoperative tumor residuals left behind? Yes, whenever there is rock hard, uh, tumor, particularly if there's any degree of enhancement, there's a 95% likelihood that you will see progression within three years. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Muhammad Safar Elahi asks, this, Dear sir, as a neurosurgeon, what will limit your attempt at complete resection in a pediatric patient? I think it's ultimately adherence to the vessels that prevents us from resecting. That's, if you will, a physical barrier to obtaining a total resection. I think the other part is trying to understand the relationship with the hypothalamus. I think what I didn't talk about, what I believe is important is if you have large cystic tumors, particularly cystic tumors extending into the third ventricle, a two-stage approach with first decompressing the cyst with either a stereotactic approach, a catheter, and seeing whether or not the tumor retracts away from the hypothalamus may guide you as to whether or not you want to be radical in removing the tumor from the floor of the third. Okay, thank you. Simona Simeonescu asks, and I quote, Hi, thanks for the presentation. What kind of behavioral medical problems appear in craniopharyngiomas survivors after conform, conformal radiation therapy? After which therapy, I'm sorry? Radiation. Radiation therapy? You know, radiation therapy depends to some degree upon the methodology and the size of the tumor. Using stereotactic radiotherapy, not radiosurgery, 
such as proton beam or um, uh, LINAC stereotactic therapies will reduce the amount of damage to the temporal lobes. Um, but nonetheless, there is a likelihood of at least five to 8% of neuropsychological injury from the radiation alone. Many patients will have some degree of injury from the size of the tumor prior to therapy. And there is going to be always long-term risk of vasculopathy, secondary stroke, um, and possible um, late uh, intellectual difficulty, particularly when temporal lobes are included within the radiation field. Okay, thank you. Erion de Andrade asks, and I quote, first of all, great lecture, Dr. Wisoff. What are your preferred approach today? And if you think the hypothalamic outcomes have some relation regarding the approach selection as endoscopic endonasal or transcranial teroneal? I think that's an excellent question, and I think we don't have the answer. There is no question that through an uh, transnasal endoscopic approach, you have the best view looking underneath the chiasm and at the hypothalamus. To some degree, the problem is you always will see these structures at the end. Um, I still remain concerned that seeing the vessels uh, is more difficult with an endoscopic approach, particularly with the larger tumors. And I think the learning curve for the transnasal approach is probably a bit higher for large tumors. I would say the smaller tumors, the prechiasmatics, and even the retrochiasmatic tumors that are less than two centimeters in hands of someone who has adequate experience are probably preferentially done transnasal these days. So in your opinion, is it possible to achieve a gross total resection of a craniopharyngioma using a transvenodal approach? It is possible. Right now, the numbers suggest it's not as frequent, but it's hard to know if that's due to philosophy or surgical intent. And again, it comes down to experience. I think the learning curve for a transnasal approach, particularly if you want a total resection, is much higher, much more difficult than a transcranial approach. Okay. Uh, I think if you are going initially for partial resection and irradiation, which is a very reasonable approach, I think a transnasal approach can be done by many, many more surgeons. Okay. Laura Daniela asks, in your experience, what are the major complications that have you had with pediatric pharyngioma? I think the most devastating complications have been vascular injuries. Um, I've experienced that once in a primary craniopharyngioma. And as I mentioned over nearly 30 years ago, we had strokes in two patients from what I believe to be um, a small vessel uh, perforated vasospasm that we've not seen in the last uh, 30 years. In the recurrent tumors, there is no question that the vessels can be very fragile, much like those in an elderly individual. And in the first 15 years, we had three serious bleeding complications. Again, I haven't seen that with experience. Hypothalamic dysfunction and obesity continues to be a problem. It seems to be occurring less frequently with experience, but I have no way of guarantee that it doesn't occur. And to me, morbid obesity is probably the longest long-term health problem. Okay. In relation with that question, Camilo asks, what, have, what has been your experience regarding the de development of vasospasm after the resection of current pharyngioma? As I said, um, I think it, it, it probably occurs, I think it accounts for five to 8% of the postoperative strokes. I think that calcium channel antagonists, nimodipine, seem to have a protective effect. Um, we have not had serious strokes from perforators now in nearly 20 years. Uh, we do continue to see some small punctate strokes. Whether or not that's preventable, I don't know, but they have not been functional 
impairments from them. Okay. Dr. Ahmed Al Radi asks In pediatric patient, is there a rule for a major reservoir only? And what adjuncts can you be used with it? So I generally would say, other than an immediate relief of pressure, I do not think that Omaya Reservoir alone is definitive therapy. I think an Omaya Reservoir with intracystic therapy is a very appropriate treatment. The problem is intracystic therapies alone, whether it's bleomycin, um, radionuclide, P32, or yttrium, if you have that available, or interferon, they're very well-tolerated therapies, but long-term, they only seem to have about a 30 to 40% durable response. So we have about a 60 to 70% progression at three years. They're definitely excellent therapies in places where you cannot afford to have new endocrine deficits. We're dealing with diabetes insipidus, can be life-threatening because of access to medication. So I do think it's definitely worthwhile, but I would always try to combine and cyst aspiration with some form of intracystic therapy. Okay, thank you. Sulon asks, and I quote, thanks professor. Is it a must to cut the pituitary stalk during pharyngioma surgery? And may I ask, what is the benefit of, of cutting the, st the stalk fat from the hypothalamus, for the hypothalamus? Sure. It is not a must. I, I've been able to preserve the stalk uh, about 10 times, and in none of those 10 patients did they have a recurrent tumor. However, I can tell you in those 10 patients that the pituitary stalk was preserved, only two of them have preserved pituitary function. Interestingly, I've had 5% of the patients who have cut the stalk who have ultimately become independent of requiring DDAVP, that is, they do not have severe diabetes insipidus. That is the reason that I believe you should cut the stalk distally as possible. And if you're going to cut the stalk, cut it early when you don't have to do a lot of retraction and secondary hypothalamic injury. Again, arachnoidal dissection, blunt dissection, avoid cutting and coagulating perforators may preserve part of the portal system. Okay, thank you, Professor. Muhammad Sumun Rana asks, how can we decide preoperatively we cannot do total resection? I would say that any patient who has a prechiasmatic tumor, Puget grade zero, assuming you are comfortable with the technique and your patients can tolerate hormone replacement therapy, those should be considered for a total resection. I think grade one tumors will depend upon the experience of the patient, I'm sorry, the experience of the physician, the surgeon, and to some degree, the desires of the family and the resources you have at, at hand, the grade one tumors. The grade two tumors, those that involve the hypothalamus extensively should only be done in high volume centers and only after the family has had a thorough discussion, both with a surgeon and a radiation therapist, so they can hear both sides of the equation. Okay. Camilo asks, what is your opinion regarding complementary treatments such as uh, cranial, well, whole cranial radiotherapy, serotactic radiotherapy, and ablative sclerosing agents in the management of craniopharyngiomas? with subtotal resection and recurrent ones? Excellent question. I think when there's a recurrent tumor, we monitor our patients very closely for the first four years, which is the time of maximal recurrence after surgery. If there's a recurrence, if the tumor is small, then I still think a repeat surgery is the safest approach, particularly if the tumor is not involving the hypothalamus. If the tumor is adherent to vessels, if we see fusiform dilatation of the carotid, or if the tumor is embedded in the hypothalamus, then we would recommend involved field irradiation and preferably with some form of stereotactic radiotherapy, if it's supercellar, 
either proton beam, um, uh, you know, we don't use gamma knife for supercellular tumors unless they're significantly removed from the hypothalamus and chiasm. Intracellular recurrence, gamma knife or other forms of stereotactic radiotherapy are excellent. Cystic recurrences, yes, I would use intracystic therapy, particularly if you have multiply recurrent tumors. Thank you, Professor. Professor, it's already 1 p.m. I will ask you if you are able to continue with some questions, additional questions you could sure, ask. Sure, I, I can talk for a few more minutes. We don't want to interrupt your schedule. So... No, as long as my voice keeps going, uh, let me have a little bit of water so I can keep talking. Of course. Just remind to the attendees, uh, Shirley will begin uh, Michael Levy in the other Zoom room with his a talk about the management of complex pediatric aneurysmal malformation. The link is in the chat and in our website. Well, thank you, Professor. And we will continue with some questions. Um, Georgios Miliaras asks, thank you for your presentation. How long will you wait to reoperate a craniopharyngioma recurrence since the first signs of recurrence? Generally, I, I try to uh, operate as soon as we see definitive growth on the recurrent imaging, particularly, particularly the um, imaging that uh, shows tumors in the supracellular region. Uh, intracellular small cystic lesions, I will watch with scans at three to four month intervals because about two thirds of those will not progress and will spontaneously resolve. So I think that is truly scarring. But supracellular recurrences, particularly non-cystic recurrences, we try to operate as soon as possible. Okay. One has to be a little careful with so-called supracellular cyst recurrence, because sometimes that can simply be um, arachnoidal loculations. So you want to be careful that you're not operating on a sort of ballooned supracellular cistern and which your radiologist may overcall. Okay, thank you, Professor. Mohamed Sunurana asks, uh, in a tumor with intraventricular, um, intraventricular tumor, do you choose transcaiosal or translamina terminalis? If the tumor is completely within the third ventricle, I would go transcaiosal. Um, I've only had two completely uh, to completely intra-third ventricular tumors. I can tell you they are particularly difficult. Um, they were both solid tumors and one has to be extremely cautious about injuring both walls of the third ventricle. One patient had a devastating outcome because both walls of the third ventricle were damaged. Um, he lived, but he lived in a very poor quality of life for many years. So I, I think the totally intra-third solid tumors are particularly dangerous lesions. Okay, thank you. What is the role of the of anti braf therapy in patients with papillary carrying pharyngiomas? Uh, that's an excellent question. There is no question that they are responsive to BRAF uh, and MEK inhibitors. The group at Harvard uh, is currently conducting a study. I would say right now, the question we have is what is the durability of the response? Is it best done as a preoperative adjuvant or pre-radiation adjuvant? Um, is it best done after resection? Or is it best done after radiation? I don't think we know the, the best timing of treatment. I don't think we know the durability of response. Um, in general, I'd recommend BRAF inhibitors in the context of a prospective study, not just off-label use. However, if you have a difficult to treat tumor that has failed other therapies and is a papillary tumor, then I think off-label use of BRAF inhibitors makes sense. I suspect it's going to be used in the future, similar to the similar to decompressing a cyst, 
They'll be used to decrease the size of the tumor and then treat it with definitive surgery or definitive irradiation. But that's still speculation. Thank you, Professor. Last question. Carlos Ramirez asks, do you open the lamina terminalis anterior or posterior from the anterior communicant segment? So usually the um, communicating uh, artery is displaced posteriorly. So we're usually a bit anterior. The tumor reflects it backwards. I try not to work between the two A2s. I find the perforate is there to be difficult. Um, so almost always the anterior communicating artery is displaced superiorly and posterior to lamina terminalis with these retrochiasmatic tumors. I would like to thank you again. Professor, on behalf of CN, I would like to thank you again. This has been a wonderful lecture. We are really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2020 IWBNC. Until the moment, we have around 3,500 uh, 3, registrants from over 120 countries. You are more than welcome to stay tuned to watch more lectures from other speakers. We hope to continue in touch with you. Have a nice day, Professor. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure and an honor to be part of this. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Professor. In a few minutes, we'll have Dr. Michael Levy. Actually, he is going on right now in the other room do with his lecture, The Management of Complex Pediatric Aneurysmal Malformations. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned in the chat or check the agenda on our website, senhus.com. Thank you.